So the title for this morning's message is The Ministry of the Law, Part 1. And the text is from Romans chapter 7, verse 7 through verse 13. So let's read those verses so they're fresh in our minds. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary. I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law said you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good. So that sin, through the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. See, Paul just finished in the first six verses of Romans chapter 7 a discussion about the law's authority. How long, he answered that question, how long are, are we bound or are you bound by the law? And remember he told us that the law is in effect as long as a man lives. And death is the only thing that separates us from the obligation of the law. And he used that illustration of marriage, the law of marriage or the bond of marriage, to show how death frees from the law. And he told us that as Christians, in verse 4 he says, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of of Christ. So we became dead to the law through the body of Christ, meaning the God, God's own Son offering His life on the cross. That's when we died to sin. It's through the body of Christ on the cross. And He said that you died that you may be married to another. And who were we then married to? It says to Him. To Him who was raised from the dead that we should bear fruit to God. Now we have been bound to the one that will never die. The one that has promised us eternal life in Him. That relationship now that will go on forever. What a great thought. So the sin that we had, Paul said, was probably stirred up by the law, right? He indicated that the law stirred up Passion. The passions of sin in us. But when you think about it, where does the problem lie? Does the problem lie in the law? The sinner or the sin? Where does the problem lie? Is the law at fault or is the, the sinner at fault? That's what Paul is trying to answer. Well, we're going to see it's the sinner who's at fault. There's nothing wrong with the law. I mean, if you think about the law, God's teachings, the Torah, He loved us enough to tell us what to do and what not to do. Why? Because He designed us. He created us. He knew what we were supposed to be. So he gave the law. See, and Paul now understands that his readers might find fault with the law. So what he's going to do is now he embarks on an explanation to really vindicate and show the law's purpose or usefulness. See, Paul again is going to anticipate questions 
that some of his readers and maybe us would come up with. Some of the things that we would think. As I was trying to say, okay, what would people think about this? They may say, I know that Paul said the law does not hold any sway over us any longer. And, and I know that we serve in a newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So then what good is the law in my life? So what good is the law? If it no longer has dominion over me, what good is it? Really, I think on the op- you might think on the opposite, people might be saying, Paul, doesn't your teaching really turn the law then into sin? Something that was binding us? See, in our text today, Paul's going to ask a question regarding the law. It's really, the gist of it is, is there something wrong with the law? If not, then what is its purpose? That's why I've entitled the message The Ministry of the Law. Because the law was meant to minister. Minister not just to the Jews, but even to us today as Christians. So, four things I want to look at as we look at the ministry of the law. The first is law reveals sin, the law arouses sin, the law kills, the law shows the sinfulness of sin. So the law reveals sin, arouses sin, kills, and shows the sinfulness of sin. So let's look at that first point. The law reveals sin in verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. So here's the big question. Paul starts with, is the law sin? Right? Sin. Missing the mark. So is the law missing the mark? Is the law in error? Is the law off target? See, this is the third of four major questions that Paul asks within this section of Romans chapter 6 and 7. Remember the first question was back in chapter 6 verse 1. And he asked if the end justifies the means. He says, so shall we sin that grace may abound. And remember he replied right away, God forbid or certainly not. And the reason was kind of followed by a rhetorical question. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? If you're dead to it, why would you go back to live in it? It makes no sense. And then down in verse 15 of chapter 6, Paul asked, Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Again, Paul replies, God forbid, certainly not. And the reason, again, is followed up by a rhetorical question. He says, don't you know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? He's saying, you're making a choice of who you're serving. You're not supposed to sin. Because you're not under law, but under grace. See, why would this thought even enter into somebody's mind? The thought of, is the law sin? I mean, why would somebody think that? Well, if you kind of read and pick pieces out of what Paul has said, you may come to that conclusion without looking at the whole of what Paul is saying here. I mean, right before this, you may just look at verse 5. It says, For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit. Right? Those passions of sin we talked about that were 
aroused by the law. Somebody say, well, yeah, it's the law's fault that those sin was aroused in me, right? It's the law's fault. But remember, sin is exposed by the law. Back in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, Paul said, Therefore the deeds of the law, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law brings the knowledge of sin. Romans 4, verse 15, For where there is no law, there is no transgression. And look what he says here in verse 7. I would not have known sin except through the law. And there are those who may say, that it appears like the law provokes sin. It's the law that brings sin about. So the conclusion of some would say, because sin, because sin takes advantage of the law, it would appear that the law is guilty. Right, Paul, though, tells us it's sin, not the law, look in verse 8, takes opportunity. Sin takes opportunity. Sin takes occasion, verse 11. That's actually the same Greek word, opportunity and occasion. It's the same Greek word. In verse 11, it's, it's sin who is the one who deceives. Sin deceives. See, Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56. He says, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. By knowing the law, you know how strong the sin is. It's not the other way around. The law does not bring the sin. By knowing the law, you know the sin. That's the point. And that word for strength that he talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, 56. The strength of sin is the law. It's that word dunamis. Where we get the word dynamite. Or power. The strength of sin is the law. See, what is Paul's answer then to that question? For somebody who's thinking that the law is the one that is sinful? Is the law sin? Again, what is it? Certainly not, or God forbid. And then he adds, on the contrary. The opposite is true. And he says the law actually points out sin. If you think about it, the law, even in the simplest form, what's the simplest form of the law? We would call it the Ten Commandments. right? Just the Ten Commandments point out Sin, doesn't it? It's sin that is the culprit, not the law. See, the true character of the law, Paul says, look at verse 12. There's the true character of the law. Therefore, the law is holy. And the commandment, holy and just and good. Who else is holy and just and good? God. See, it's God's law. It's God's teachings. And His teachings are following His nature. They are holy, just, and good. We'll look at that when we get to verse 12. But Paul now gives a particular example. Look at the end of verse 7 there. He says, For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet. So he says, I would not have known, or the idea there, I would not have been made conscious of covetousness. What is covetousness? Well, it can be translated as earnest desire, or some translated as irregular desire or simply lust to covet then when it says you shall not covet 
Covet means to set your heart upon or to desire, to long for, to lust after. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet. Notice what Paul doesn't say and start with. He doesn't start with murder. He doesn't start with stealing, lying, adultery to drive home his point. He chooses what we list as last in the Ten Commandments. Covetousness. You shall not covet. Or I love the way the old King James, and that's the way I usually read, thou shalt not covet. Right? So why does he pick covetousness? In Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, it says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not covet or nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Basically, anything you don't have, and I would add even some of the things you do have, don't covet. Don't love them. Don't lust after them. Have an evil desire for them. See, why would Paul pick covetousness to make his point here? Well, they think he did that because it differs. It differs from the other ones that I said, murder, stealing, lying, adultery. Because covetousness is really an inward attitude. It's not an outward action. See, covetousness, right? Evil desire, lust. To covet means to, to set your heart upon, to desire, to long for. You shall not set your heart See, it's covetousness that leads to us breaking the other commandments. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 36, Incline my ears to your testimonies and not to covetousness. I love that. Let me hear your words, Lord. Let my heart be there instead of covetousness. See, covetousness is, is a matter of the heart. It's on the inside. See, Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. He said, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. It's desiring that which is not yours to desire, to have. One commentator said, in answering this question of why would Paul use covetousness, I loved his answer. He said, covetousness is an insidious sin that most people never recognize in their own lives, but God's law reveals it. See, covetousness is something people don't even realize in their own lives sometimes. Until God's law reveals it. That's what Paul said saying here, I didn't even know I was coveting until the law said I shouldn't be coveting. Because then I had to know what coveting was and then I found out I was really coveting. So did the law make him covet? Or was he already coveting before he read it in the law? That's the argument Paul's making here, right? If you could, turn to Mark chapter 10. I think a good example of, of that of covetousness or where you set your heart can be found in Mark chapter seven, chapter ten, sorry, verses seventeen through twenty-two. See what's going to happen here? Jesus is going to use the law to reveal the sin in who we call the rich young ruler, the rich young man. And really, what he's going to do is show him his heart. But then he's going to show him his need for a Savior by using the law. So in Mark chapter 10, verse 17, it says, Now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, 
What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Notice the question there, what shall I do? Or what must I do? And when he calls him good teacher, the idea there, that word good, he's saying, you've achieved that, teacher. You've almost achieved it. You're a good teacher. Show me what you did so I can do it. You know, show me what I have to do to be like you, good teacher, to get eternal life. And Jesus right away says to him in verse 18, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. See, Jesus here is gently asking him why. Why are you calling me uniquely good? See, Jesus here is not denying his own goodness. See, that was not the question here at issue. But Jesus was asking the young man to think through what he meant by goodness. What do you mean by good? Recognize in your mind what quality and what standard you're using as good. Because there is only one that is truly good. And that's God. So if that's the standard, nobody hits that. See, he needed to realize was that as far as he was concerned, the goodness that the young man was speaking about, that goodness was unattainable. Because it was the trueness unique to God, you know, goodness that was truly unique to God. So Jesus goes on, and he says in verse 19, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not commit murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your mother and your father. And look what the young man answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth, I can check every one of those off the list. The young man's saying to him, you know what, Jesus, I was brought up in a good and respectable Jewish boy. I followed the law. I responded to the teaching that I was given in synagogue. See, obedience, he's saying, to the law of Moses, man, that was the top of my list. And I made sure I checked everything off. It was the passion of my life. So there he is, he's saying, you know what, I kept all these. I can't think of anything, Lord. I can't think of anything that I didn't do or keep. So basically what he's saying is, you know what, Lord, I didn't commit any major outward sin. I'm good there. But what's the truth? And where is Jesus going to go? He's going to go to the heart. Verse 21, it says, Then Jesus looking at him, loved him, and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. So Jesus is looking at this eager young man who's right fell down before him, and notice what it says, looked at him, Jesus loved him. What does it mean by he loved him? Well, he loved him because what he's going to do is he told, he's about to tell him what he needs to hear. He tells him what he needs to hear. And he went straight to the root of the sinfulness in that man's life. A sinfulness which the young man was not even aware of. Another commentator said, like an arrow from, the, from, from a bow, the words of Jesus went straight to the heart. But it was out of love, because he loved him. He told him the truth. What was this young man's particular sin? He loved his money. He loved his life. He loved the things. His desire 
His heart was set on these things. Even though the commandment, thou shalt not covet, was not said here, but it's all about this man's heart. This young man's heart. So what does Jesus tell this young man? Go get rid of your stumbling block. Get rid of it. Get rid of that which has your heart. Just get rid of it. Sell everything you have. And take up your cross. Basically, die to yourself and come follow me. See, Jesus knew for the, this young man, in his case, that's what he had to do to be able to follow Jesus with all of his heart. He had to give it all up because that's what had his heart. Look at verse 22. But he, the young man, was sad at this word, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He had a lot of stuff, but I would say that stuff had him. So instead of admitting his sin and seeing the sinfulness in his heart, he rejected Christ because the love for his stuff was the most important thing in his life. covetousness the desire for something that is not yours or even that evil desire of holding on to what is god's see that's the other thing everything we have comes from god and if we hold on to it like it's ours we are coveting god what is god's and holding on to it see you may say well it was his stuff well it was god's stuff And he was holding on to it. And it had his heart. It took the place in his heart where God should have been. Covetousness is anything that replaces God in our hearts, isn't it? It's the desire. And Paul says he didn't know he was coveting until the law said you shall not covet. That's really what he's pointing out here. That's what he says, right? What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. So what's the first ministry of the law? It reveals sin. Next ministry is the law. The law Paul says, arouses sin. Verses 8 and 9. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire, for apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the law, or when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. What he says is, but sin took opportunity, or taking opportunity by the commandment, by the word. The word taking means to receive or seize, grab hold of. And the opportunity would be, think of that more as a starting point or the base of operations. So it took what it now knew, hooked onto it, And use that as a base of operations to start all kinds of evil desires. See, the law, Paul said, seems to arouse wrongdoing. That's what he said in verse 5, right? For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law We're at work in our members to bear fruit to death. See, that idea of arousing the word or the law, arousing sinful desires in us. Did you ever tell a kid 
not to touch something. Right? Don't touch that. It's hot. Right? Put your finger right on it. Don't go on the grass. What do they want? What do they do? Don't jump in that puddle. You know what? Unfortunately, we've got to say that to adults sometimes too, don't we? Even as adults, people will tell us not to do something. And what do we inherently want to do? Go do it. Hey, don't touch that. The paint's wet. Is it really? <laughs> it arouses sinful desire. It aroused the desire in you that you probably had no intention of touching that wall until somebody said, don't touch it. That's what he's saying here. Sometimes the law. We hear the commandment. Oh, what is that? It does the opposite of what it's intended to do. Is the problem with that commandment, don't touch? If somebody tells me not to touch the wall because there's paint on the wall, is the problem with them telling me not to touch it? Or is the problem with me not listening to it? That's Paul's whole point here. The problem isn't the law. Even though it does arouse it in me, I'm still responsible for it. I'm the problem. Guess what? Human nature opposes and despises the law. Human nature does. Why, Paul tells us, look at Romans chapter 8, verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. That word enmity, again, is, is hostile, right? It's an en enemy or an adversary of God's law. So the carnal mind, our basic human mind, is opposed to God. Is an adversary of God. And it's subject, right? For it is not subject to the law of God, that word subject, right? To place yourself under or to be subordinate to. Right? What did Jesus say to the rich young man? Sell all your stuff, take up your cross, and follow me. Get rid of what's taking your heart. Turn the other way. Follow me. Submit yourself to me and go forward. Unwilling to do any of that. See, Paul is making the point that the law is good, but the flesh is at fault. Right? The law is good, but sinners are at fault. Romans chapter 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Amen. Because man could not do it, He sent His own Son to do it. See, what was that sin's impact on the Apostle Paul? He says it produced in me, in verse 6, all manner of evil desire. All manner of evil desire. What's evil desire? Again, from the inside. The desiring. Evil. The opposite of what is God. Godly. Think about it. Paul was a devout Pharisee. And he took pride in in being a Pharisee. Right? Remember he said, my former conduct in Judaism, he said in Galatians chapter 1? Everybody knows that. And you know how I persecuted the church beyond measure and tried to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond any of my contemporaries. I could check off more boxes than anybody else around me. I did it, I did it, I did it, I didn't do it, I did it, I didn't do it. Right? He said, I... Checked it all off. And I advanced. And then he went on and he was talking to the Philippian church. He says, Yet indeed, 
I counted all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. See, he said what things were gained to him before in, F- in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. What things were gained to him? He says now he's counted them lost for Christ. He said he wanted to be found in him. Found in Christ now. Not having his own righteousness, which is from the law. Not checking off all the boxes. But that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. He said, I tried being righteous. I was the poster boy for Judaism. I checked every box. But my heart was wrong. There was nothing righteous in me. See, it's Paul saying there that sin, sin, he says, took opportunity by the commandment. And the commandment which we already saw is holy and good. He said sin took opportunity by that. And that produced in me evil desire. He went on to say so that everything, everything I ever attained, likened to a dunghill. Right? A rubbish. Everything I did on my own. Because it was done with the wrong heart. Look, so he says right here in Romans chapter 7, verse 8, But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin is dead. He's saying sin works in a person. Sin brings forth that evil desire. Notice how broad of evil desire that there was there. He says, all manner of evil desire. Broad spectrum, he says. It brought in this desire in me. See, Paul, as we close here, addresses at the end of verse 8, what happens when the law fails to impress the soul? The soul. Look what he says. He says, For apart from the law, sin is dead. Or, for without the law, sin was dead. Apart from. That's that word parted or alien from or without. And he said, Sin is dead. See, death, again, is separation. Death is not being affected by external stimuli. Death can also mean dormant. So Paul is not trying to say that sin has no existence apart from the law, but that sin is dead in the sense that it is somewhat dormant and fully active and and does not overwhelm like it does when the law becomes known. You might be thinking, well, what, when might we be without knowledge of the law? Or be without the law? How is that possible? Well, think about before knowledge of the law. Taking a baby, an infant, a child. Though they're not aware of the law, Babies are by nature sinners. They are by nature selfish. They, by nature, do the things that are, don't do the things that are written in the law. But like I said, you tell them not to do something as they get older, and it puts in their mind to do it. So there, that's one example. 
or Paul would have been thinking of like Gentiles, those that weren't raised as Jews that didn't have the law of God, right? They didn't have that official God's law, but he's already told us back in chapter 2 that Gentiles still have a law in their heart. There still is a matter of right and wrong. And then even as a saved person, they can say, I have no use for the law anymore. Right? I'm free from the bonds, so (laughs) law ain't going to do anything for me anymore. But guess what? The law still reveals God's character. That's one of the things. That's where we as Christians then are ministered to by the law because the law then revealed God's character. It reveals His will. And that's why we should obey because we love God. Not because we're trying to check boxes. So Paul's saying if the conscience is not aware of the law, he's saying then sin appears to be dormant or ineffectual. See, the ignorant, those who are ignorant of the law, they see themselves as just and good. I'm a good person. Right? The rich young ruler would have said, I'm a good person. I never killed anybody. I never mur- right? I never committed adultery. I didn't even lie. I, didn't... I was perfect on the outside. So I'm a good person. But then, Jesus presented the covetousness, right? And then he saw it. See, the ignorant would see himself as just or good. But notice I didn't say that sin was not present. The sin was still there. Only the person didn't see themselves as being with sin. So how would we take what we've just learned and apply it to our lives today? The problem isn't with God and His law. The problem is with the person and what they do with it. And I think we as Christians, if we're going to be the bright light that we are in the world, when we present the Gospel, we need to be like Jesus and start with the law. What is the standard? So that we can be like Paul and say, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Present the law. Present its penalty. And then present its Savior. That's the Gospel. Let's be bold witnesses. Next week we're going to look at the rest of the ministry of the law. Hopefully. Hopefully. Or in the next two weeks, we'll see. Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for again gathering us to be able to go through your word, to be able to see that your teachings are holy and just and good, just like you are. We are the ones with the problem. We're the ones who must remember to walk with You. To live our lives for You. To surrender and take up our crosses daily and follow You. So Lord, just pray for opportunities to witness this week. So that we can present the full Gospel And if people do walk away like the young ruler did, it's on them, it's not on us. That we present the full gospel, the full biblical gospel. So Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.